I, I don't have to tell you what happened yesterday, but yesterday we witnessed the attempted assassination of our former president uh, of the United States. And uh, how many of you know that America, it was a sad day. For me, it was a very sad day. I got very emotional. And I got emotional because this is a great country. It's been, the, it's been a light on the hill for, for many years. And when we see this, stuff, this type of stuff happening, you know what? We expect it in third world countries. We expect it in other parts of the world, but not in America. And I couldn't help but feel that we need God's hand. We need God's protection. We need wisdom more than ever before. What I want to do today is I want us to pray for the peace, for the safety, and for the unity of America. We want to pray for the Trump family. We want to pray for all of those affected. Lives were lost. Even the life of the shooter was lost. And family, he represents moms and dads and siblings that are grieving and hurting today. And how many of you know they need our prayers also? And, uh, you know, the Bible, we know this verse well. Uh, there's a scripture that we read often that says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and, give, and will forgive their sins and I will heal, heal their land. You know, during these coming days and weeks, uh, I pray there's going to be a lot of discussion. Uh, there's going to be a lot of hostility, a lot of anger. Uh, I pray that your voices would be voices of peace and of reconciliation. I pray that your voices will not be voices of anger and hostility and division. We have enough of that. We don't need to contribute or add to that. I pray that we would be peacemakers. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. I pray that if you, as you have discussions about this, that you will not add fuel to the fire promoting the anger and the disgust that, that rightly so some feel, but that we would say, you know, bring peace and pray. And as God's hand be upon this country. Right now, this country, there's elections, every election cycle gets crazy. But uh, in my 50 years of being aware of politics, this has been the, the these last couple of years has been the worst uh, cycle of politics that I have seen. The division, the hate, uh, the anger, you know, what the animosity that exists. Uh, people are afraid to say they're Democrats. People are afraid to say they're Republicans because it is so crazy out there. You know, that needs to stop. That we, and and it, it needs to start with us, Christians. We need to put a stop to it. I'll tell you what concerns me. I think sometimes we're the ones promoting it. And that is a sad commentary about the church of Jesus Christ. No, we are peacemakers. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Now, I'm not asking you to not have opinions. I'm not asking you to have strong feelings about what's going on. But as a Christian, I'm asking you to, let's, let's be the answer, uh, not the problem. The uh, solution you know what? Not adding problems to what's going on already. Can I hear a good amen? amen? So would you bow your heads? Let us pray. Father God, we're, we're sat and our hearts are broken, Lord, as to what we witnessed yesterday, Lord, on television across this country. And Father, what a, what a sad day it is, Lord, when, uh, when, when our, our disagreements lead us to want to assassinate one another, kill one another. And Father, we just pray, God, that your peace and your comfort, we pray for wisdom, Lord, our, our, our leaders, as they lead our country, we definitely pray for the families affected, the Trump family. Lord, those that lost their lives of, of the victim, we, uh, of the perpetrator, we pray for them, Lord. We pray, God, for those that were there and were traumatized, Lord, by what they saw. And Father, we just pray, God, that your hand of, of peace and comfort would be upon our nation. Lord, for us who saw it at a distance, God, give us calm hearts, give us clear minds. And God, to, to come forward, Lord, with wisdom and with grace and with much love, Lord. Lord, I don't want to be a part, God, uh, of the, the nastiness and the ugliness that's already happening. Lord, I, I want to be uh, an instrument in your hands that brings peace and love and solutions. At the end of the day, Lord, we know that your will will be done as to who will be in the, uh, the White House. And Lord, we don't look to the White House. We look to you as a source of guidance and strength and direction, Lord. So, Father, we pray. Uh, we commit this to you. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And, and God's people said... Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, guys. Keep this in prayer. You know, we're in a series of messages entitled Maintaining Truth. We're in 1st of John, in chapter 2. You have your Bibles, you can turn there, or you can look up to the screen when the scriptures come out. But one of the things that the Apostle John is writing about, he's writing to us about false teachers, about deceptors, about deception, about heresy, heretics. Uh, already in John's days, which was only 50 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 35 to 50 years after the resurrection, already there was a lot of false teaching in the church. Uh, Christianity was being challenged by false teachers. 
And it is no different today. So, so John, John describes to us the basic characteristics of counterfeit Christianity. Look at what he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. And this is a, a little recap. We've been here already. But in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Notice that John talks about the last hour. By the way, the last hour refers to the time before Jesus Christ comes again. He came once. We know he's going to come again. There will be a second appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that early church that sprung out of the ministry of Jesus and of the apostles, they expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. They were preparing for Jesus to come his second time while they were still alive. And of course he didn't. And here we are now in the 21st century and still Jesus hasn't come. So the last hours has come to describe a kind of a time more than a duration of time. It describes a time of crises, of dangerous times, of times of great risk. And John says these things are going to happen throughout history, throughout the history of the church, until Jesus Christ comes again. And he says, not only the last times, but he says the Antichrist will come. Now we know from the Bible that the Antichrist is a world ruler who will oppose the reign of Christ. But he says before he comes and before he appears, you know what, even now he says many Antichrists have come. Many have come in the spirit of that Antichrist who's going to oppose, who's going to present himself as a substitute for Jesus Christ, who's going to come, you know what, with false, with false teaching. Already that spirit is at work among us. And John acknowledges that there already was in existence in his times and is definitely in our time today. So what does John say? John says very simply, his, his message is stay away from false teachers. Stay away from those that come with the gospel contrary to the one that's historical, that's biblical, that was taught by Jesus, the apostles. Because these false teachers have already come in and are trying to change it. And John says, you know what, they are imposters, they are frauds, avoid them. Stay clear of these charlatans, of these deceivers. Because the only thing they want to do is they want to exploit you. Now, they, all they want to do is just lie to you. All they want to do is just confuse you. Now, one of the things that I told you last week is that there's a couple of things that we need to do. First of all, we need to read the Bible. You know, you're not going to know the truth if you don't read the Bible. Now, by reading the Bible, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to know what the Bible says. By reading the Bible, you know what the Bible says. Now, people say, well, Pastor, I read the Bible, but I don't understand it. Exactly. By reading the Bible, you know what it says. The second step is you got to try to understand it. Understand what the Bible that requires a little bit more work than reading. Don't get frustrated when you're reading and you can't understand. You're reading to know what it says. Then the next step is, what does it mean? You know, what is it saying? Because sometimes what it says isn't clear. Anyway, for us, it's clear to those who received it, but it's not clear for us. So I want you to know that those who received the words that we read, they understood completely, they understood what it meant. Because it was spoken to them according to their time, in ways that they could understand it. So as we read the Bible, we know what it says. As we study it, we seek to understand it. But the third thing, before we can apply it to our lives, because that's the next step, is we have to ask ourselves, what did it mean to them? How did they understand this? What was their understanding when they hear John says, these are the last days and the Antichrist? Well, what, what did they understand? What did they understand by the term many Antichrists? Well, what John is referring to, and they understood it, it was these false teachers. Now that we look back, historically, we have given them a name. They're called Gnostics. We know their movement as Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism wasn't as developed as it is today or was later on in the times of John. It was basically just developing, just, just, just coming about. It was, it, it was a false teaching that tried to undermine biblical Christianity early on in the, in the early church. Early Christians understood that. Now, the Gnostics, the, the Jesus of the Gnostics was not the Jesus of history. It was not the Jesus of the apostles. They offered a counterfeit Jesus for the real Jesus. But here's a question that we ask ourselves, and they ask themselves, how, how, how do we recognize these deceivers? How do we recognize these charlatans, these false teachers? So what John does is he gives some characteristics of them. You know, and he tells them, and, and, and we can understand this. Look at what he says. First of all, in verse 19, he says, they have departed from the fellowship. They were part of us, but they're no longer of us. Look at what he says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. 
But they went out so that it might become clear that they all are not of us. Now notice what John says, something very simple. Counterfeit Christianity does not come from without. It comes from within. It starts in the church. A lot of counterfeit religion, a lot of counterfeit Christianity are people that attended Christian churches. These Gnostics were Christians that grew up in the church, that early church. And today, we have hundreds, hundreds of counterfeit religions that literally started in the church, the traditional, basic, historical Christian church, and have started their own. And that's what John is saying. They were with us, but they left us to start their own. They're no longer part of us. That's evident that they were not of us. Now you say, well, Pastor, what are some examples? Well, there's a guy by the name of Charles T. Russell. You're going to see a picture of him. Charles T. Russell, the guy on the left, is the founder of the Jehovah Witnesses. And uh, he came from a Presbyterian congregational Seventh-day Adventist background. That was his background. And, and what he did is that he didn't like what he was hearing, so he started his own religion that, that, that tries to cover itself under the umbrella of Christianity. Now, what did they do? What did he do? What did he change? Well, he changed a lot of things. First of all, you know what Jehovah's Witnesses reject the Trinity. They reject the, the inherent immortality of the soul. They don't believe in hell. You know what? Actually, they do. They say hell is now here on earth. You are living in hell right now. You know, and, and, and they do not observe Christmas. They do not observe Easter. They do not celebrate their birthdays. They do not vote. They do not run for offices. You know what? And the reason why is because they say all of that has its origin in pagan religion and is a form of idolatry. When you celebrate your birthday, you are worshiping yourself. So don't celebrate your birthday. When you, when you salute the flag, you are worshiping the flag in this country don't do that. The Bible says you shouldn't. And they believe that with all of their heart. And he has come out, came out with his own Bible, the world translation, believed that Jesus was not the Son of God, but he was an angel. And, and, and you say, well, where did they get that from? Well, they just twist everything around. That's where they get that. Jehovah Witnesses. Now, there was a guy who appeared uh, by the name of Sung Young Moon, you know, in the 80s. Uh, Sung Young Moon, uh, you'll see a picture of him again. The guy on the right, he started what is called the Unification Church. He, he came, began in the Presbyterian Church. We know the Unification Church as the Moonies. Remember the Moonies? And uh, they had a teaching that was pretty, pretty interesting. And uh, Moon said that he was the Messiah. You know, when Jesus came, Jesus did not fulfill his role as a Messiah. And the reason why Jesus did not fulfill his role is because he never got married. He needed to have children, and children were important. So Moon says, you know what? My wife and I have nine children. They are, they are of race that have, uh, that have no original sin, and the mission of Christ is finished through us. And he came up with a lot of really weird stuff. Marriage was very important. That's why often when you saw him in the news, he was having these mass marriage ceremonies. That's every time they showed it because that was very important to him. And then, of course, there were others. <clears throat> there was Joseph Smith. Uh, you know, Joseph Smith, you're going to see a picture of him, a founder of uh, Mormonism or the Latter day Saints. By the way, that, that picture that you see of him is, is, not, is not for sure. There were no actual pictures taken of him. So the depictions that we have of Joseph Smith are, are depictions that come from some of the description that people gave of him, but there is no actual pictures of him. But he started what we call the, the Mormon church. He grew up within the church. He was disillusioned with the Christian churches. And, and he believed God was calling him to become a prophet. And his job was to banish false teaching and restore the church to its true foundation. And that's why it's called the Church of the Latter-day Saints, right? Now, Mormons uh, believe in the plurality of gods. You know what? Including the, the Father, the Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Uh, they also believe that Jesus and, 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 and the Father were once human beings that, that, that walked the earth. And you know what? They became gods. And one day, you're going to become a god. And if you're a good Mormon, you're going to not only become a god, you're going to be given your own planet. And you're going to have all kinds of wives. Amen. It's going to be beautiful, Okay. Now you say, Pastor, are you sure? Absolutely. Actually, I'm sure. Study this very carefully. Mormons also believe that, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff. I don't even know where to start to tell you. They believe that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers, were blood, were, were soul brothers. In other words, they, uh, they, they believe that, uh, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. But here's what's interesting about Mormons. They're great people. Now, I'm not making judgment about them as people. I'm talking about what they believe. And I'm not trying to put them down. I'm just, making, I'm just exposing you to the, some of the counterfeit, and they're, they're, they consider themselves Christians. And yet, some of their beliefs are far, far away from what Christians are, okay? Now, there's a lot of others. There's hundreds of them. You know, there was Jim Jones in the 70s. You know what? There's Heaven's Gate. 
You know what? People, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of groups out there that talk and tell you that they represent Jesus Christ, and yet they don't. Right? They are far. They are, they are, they are charlatans. They are deceivers. They do not rep- rep- represent. So if you were to investigate the history of, of the false cults and the anti-Christian religious systems in today's world, you'll find that most cases their founders started out in a local church. That's why John says, back then, still true today, you know what, they were with us, but they were not of us. They went out from us. Why? Their teaching is contrary to historical Christianity. Now, people can believe whatever they want. You say, well, Pastor, people can, I I agree with that. They can push whatever they want. But if it deviates from biblical, historical Christianity, it isn't Christian. Don't call yourself Christian. It's not Christian. If you're saying and doing things contrary to what Jesus taught and said, you know what, things that the church has stood for, don't claim to be one of us. Don't claim Christianity. So there's a lot out there that claim, and that's what confuses a lot of people. They say they're Christian, yeah, but they're not of us. No, they're not Christians. You know what, they like it because it's more acceptable to be called a Christian than to be called something else. So what John says, when John writes to the church, he says, stay away from those who have left the family. Avoid those who do not teach the truth about Jesus Christ. They started within us, but they were not of us. They left to do their own thing. The second thing he says is in verse 20 and 21. He says, they have denied the faith. Notice, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. These false teachers were were spreading lies. One of the lies that they were spreading, they Two very popular words that they use were anointed and were knowledgeable. And the idea is that we have a special connection with God, so you need to listen. You know what? And we have special knowledge from God that you don't have, so you need to listen to us. They're the only ones that said, you know, I, I have it. The rest of you don't have it. Now, now, what was happening is that those Christians were feeling inferior, intimidated by those false teachers. And so we do today. Every once in a while, someone will come out and say, listen, today God gave me a brand new word. It's new. You need it. Listen up. If you follow it, you know what's going to revolutionize your life. And you know what? And right away, they want you to feel they are superior to you. They have a pipeline to God. They have knowledge from God that you don't have. Now, they might have knowledge. If it's of the word of God, that's okay. You know, my, my role as a pastor is not to bring you new revelation. You know, my, my, my role as a pastor is to clarify revelation that's already been revealed, the Word of God. You know, well, my job is not to come up with new stuff, with, with exciting stuff, with mystical stuff, with, you know what, stuff that, you know, tickles the ear. My stuff is to tell you, thus saith the Lord, and just bring clarity to it and not say this is new. Anything that's new, it's, you know what, there's nothing new in the Bible. It's not of God because everything you need to know is in the Word of God. Can I hear a good amen to that? So John tells them, listen, these false teachers, you know what? They want to make you feel like you don't know, you're not anointed. No, no, you are anointed. In other words, that means you you have the ability to do something, to understand. You have knowledge. Obviously, you have knowledge, he says, because you know what? You have saved. You have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. You've given him your life. You have. You might not be at the level, you know, you have knowledge. You might not have the same knowledge I have, but my knowledge is not superior or better, you know what, than the knowledge. You have the basic knowledge, and that's enough. So the third thing that he says is that these false teachers are liars. Not only did they come from among us, not only have they denied the faith, make you feel like, you know, you need to listen to them, but they're false teachers. Look at what he says in verse 22. He says, and who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Verse 23, anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Notice that the primary attack of these false teachers was on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he says, those who deny that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, those who deny that Jesus is the Lord, they're liars. And notice what they do, they deny. And, and what, do they, what does that mean? They don't accept, they reject, they refuse. They're false teachers. They, re- they deny God the Father himself. And, and they have left the faith and they no longer represent the Christian faith. So what John does, he basically gives us the fundamental issue of their error. Now, the reason this is important is because Christians don't agree on a lot of stuff. But there are some things that are fundamental that we have to agree on. And one of them is who Jesus is and what did he come to do. You know, well, we can have different opinions about how long a church service should be. Should we have communion every day? 
once a month, every Sunday. We can disagree as to when Jesus is coming, whether, you know, we can disagree as to what the judgments are. We can disagree as to how you're supposed to dress when you get up here. We can disagree on all kinds of stuff, but there are some very basic stuff that we cannot disagree on if we're going to be Christians. Amen? And uh, listen, now there are some people that don't understand that. There are some people that want to fight with other Christians about everything. No, no, the only things we need to fight for and stand for is the basic doctrines, and that's what John is saying. One of the basic things that these guys are attacking is who Jesus was and the work of the Lord, and they deny that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That is super important. Now, 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 now I have run into people that say to me, well, you know, I, I don't believe in Jesus, and, and, and I have interesting conversations with people. And this is what I hear from people. People say, well, you know, Vic, uh, uh, you know, I'm a pretty good guy, and I don't think I need Jesus, and I do believe that one day we're going to stand before God, because I do believe in a God, I do believe there's going to be accountability, but, but I don't think I need Jesus Christ. I, I'm going to stand before God, and I'm going to make my case, and I'm sure God's going to understand that I was really a good guy. I'm, I'm sure he's going to get it. And, and then they'll tell me, you know what, I, I do believe he was a good man, I believe he was a good teacher, but I don't believe he was a son of God. I don't believe he's a savior of the world. And I find that argument interesting. And I'll tell you why I find it interesting is because, you know what, you can't believe. If you believe, you know what, uh, if Jesus, Jesus said he was the son of God. Jesus said he was the savior of the world. Uh, they, they, they crucified him because they said, you being a man, you claim to be God. Several times they tried to kill him because he told them he was the son of God. And they said, that's no way. And they were really offended by it. The testimony of Jesus is that he came from the Father to save the world from their sin, that he was the Messiah, that he was going to die, be buried for three days, and resurrect from the dead, and, you know, go before the Father. He came to be the savior of the world. That's what he said. So when you say, I believe he's a good teacher and I believe he's a good man, a good man doesn't say that they're the son of God. A good teacher doesn't say, I'm the Messiah. You know, how many of you think I'm a good man? Say, come on now, say amen. All right. <laughs> how many of you think I'm a good teacher? Say, say amen. All right. Now, that's cool, right? Now, what if I got up here and said, but I'm the Messiah, I'm the son of God, you need to follow me. You would say, dude, you, you lost it, man. You're crazy. You, you know what? I'm out of here. This is, this is nonsense. You wouldn't believe that. You wouldn't go out and say, but, you know, but, but I still think he's a good man. No, you're going to say, he's a lunatic. He's a nut. He's a psycho. Right? You wouldn't say, I'm a good teacher. You would say, I'm a false teacher. You know what? You would say, there's no way you would embrace any of that. And yet, there are some of you that reject Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, but in your mind, he's a good man. You know what? He's a, you know what? He's a good teacher. He might even be the Savior of the world for some people, but he's not my Savior. That's not an option. Either he is or he isn't. And if he isn't, he's a liar. He's a fraud. If he isn't, you know what? He's someone that, that, you know, just totally, totally ignore. But Jesus said he was the son of God, the Messiah, the savior of the world. And if he's not the son of the God, if he's not the Messiah or the savior of the world, then he's a liar. Or at least he was a little confused. Or at least a little deluded, had some psychological issues. But he can't be a good man or a good teacher and at the same time, be the, be, the, be the son of God. I believe he was a good man. I believe he was a, a great teacher. But more important than that, I believe he was the son of God. Now, these false teachers, John says, first of all, he says they are liars. And they're falsifiers. They speak falsehood. They say things that are not true. And, and what are they lying about? They're lying about who Jesus was. They're lying that Jesus was the son of God. He's not necessary. You know what? It's not what you guys think. That's what they're saying. And he says, I want you to know, John, they're big liars. They're, they're horrific liars. How many of you know that lying is a sin? Amen. So let me camp on this concept of lying for a few minutes. You know, what lying is a sin, it's wrong because it's displeasing, it displeases God. It doesn't honor God. You know, when you look in the Bible, the first sin in this world involved a lie told to Eve. The Bible says that Satan came in the form of a serpent. Let me read it to you in Genesis 3, 1 through 4. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees of the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. 
You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. Notice the lie. Satan tells Eve, listen, come on. Eve, you're not that ignorant. You're not that dumb. That's ridiculous. You know, how can you die from eating a fruit from a, uh, from a fruit tree? That doesn't make sense. You're smarter than that. You're more intelligent than that. And of course, she believed it, but it was a lie. You know, and uh, I want you to know that lie, uh, lying is wrong all the time. Now, people say to me, well, Pastor, the, the Bible says that they would die. They didn't die. They got kicked out of the garden, but they continued to live. And, and the reason that happens is the word die actually is, is the, the concept of dying is separation. So when you die, you know what? Your immaterial part separates from your material part. In other words, when you die, what's inside of you, the immaterial part, and you're, you're separated from your body, that we call that physical death. But the Bible talks about spiritual death. Spiritual death is when in your spirit you are separated from God. You have no fellowship. You have no communion. You know what? You're not aware of God. You could care less of God. So the Bible says before we came to Christ, we were spiritually dead, but we were quickened. We were made alive when the Holy Spirit came into our lives and we accepted Christ. All of a sudden, our spiritual life came to life. And you noticed it right away because all of a sudden, now you're interested in God, the things of God, church, the Bible, pray, stuff that you cared less about before. But now that you've been quickened and made alive, spiritually alive you're not dead all of a sudden wow there's this urging there's this sense in my heart I want God and then the Bible talks about eternal death separation from God for eternity the Bible says one day we will all stand before God and those that rejected him will be cast into the lake of fire to be separated from God for eternity so when the Bible says God says you're going to die they died they died spiritually they became separated from God there was a there was a division between them and God and, and because, you know what, they listened to a lie. You know, the ninth commandment of the Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16 says, You shall not bear false witnesses against your neighbor. Share keret in the Hebrew, which means don't promote deceit. Don't push falsehood. Don't promote what is not true. You know, God, God takes very serious. By the way, this thing of lying is very serious to God. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. But you know, Paul, writing to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 9, notice what he writes. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Stop lying. How many of you like for people to lie to you? I don't. You know what? Lie to me and uh, I'll listen to you. I'll nod my head. But I'll say he's a liar and that can't be trusted. Okay? Can I hear a good amen to that? <laughs> now, I might, you might have been a liar before coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, but now that you're a Christian, Paul says, don't, don't lie. We don't bear false witnesses. You know why God hates lying so much? Because when we lie, we're acting in accordance with who the devil is. Because he is a liar. The Bible calls him the father of lies. He's a president of the Liars Club. Amen. Somebody says, no, no, I know somebody who's a president of the Liars Club, and it's not the devil, you know. But, but that's what the Bible says. One day, the, the, the Gospels tell us the story that one day Jesus is preaching and uh, the religious leaders don't like his message. So they try to kill him. They find ways to do away with him. And he notices that and he sees that. He, he gets away from them. But John records for us what Jesus said about that in John chapter 8, verse 44. Notice what it says. He says, for you are, this is Jesus speaking, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. He's a liar. And John said, you know what? These false teachers that are promoting stuff that's not true, they are liars. You know what? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is a liar. That's the supreme lie of all ages, that Jesus is not God, that he's not the Savior of the world, that he's not the Messiah. By the way, Jesus Christ is not his first name and his last name. Jesus, Yeshua, God saves, is his name. Messiah is a title. Messiah is a Hebrew word for, for the anointed one. The Greek version of that is Christ. Messiah and Christ are the same thing. He is the anointed one. You know, some people think Christ is his last name. No, no. Messiah is a reference to his work, what he came to do. Jesus came to save this, the world of its sin. He came to be the Savior. That's why he came. That's why God so loved the world, he sent his only son to send him into the world to save us. He's the only one capable and able to forgive us of our sins. You know, Jesus recognized that. Jesus said that. 
You know, we know that Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30. We know he started his ministry getting baptized. After he got baptized, the Bible tells us he goes through the Mount of Temptation there, which is a big mountain outside of Jericho. Every time we go to Israel, we go to Jericho. You can see the Mount of Temptation. There's, a, there's some Greek Orthodox monasteries up there. There's a, there's a cable car that takes you up there. And, and it shows that we've never gone up there because it's just wilderness. We've seen the wilderness. Amen. But, but the Bible says that after he got, after the 40 days of fasting and being tempted, he comes down and he goes to the town where he's from, from Nazareth. And as was his custom, he goes to the synagogue. Luke tells us the story. We pick it up in verse 16 of Luke chapter 4. Notice what Luke writes. So Jesus, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In other words, I'm anointed. He's anointed me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Now, I want you to imagine that. They're sitting down. By the way, the synagogues are small. They probably sit 100 people, maybe. And the Bible says after he was done, everybody was just struck. Not because he read dramatically, but because of what he said. And then in verse 21, it says... And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus says, that was referring to me. Everybody knew Isaiah 61 was was a reference to the Messiah who would come and the work that he would do. He would, you know, he would, you know, he'll proclaim the gospel, give relief to the captives, bind up the brokenhearted. That was his work. He was anointed to save the world. That's what he came to do, given the ability, the capacity to say the reason you and I can have a relationship with God is because of what Jesus Christ did. Now, the devil hates that. He hates that truth. And he does everything he can to constantly distort, to twist. You know what? The basis of the Christian message. And he wants, it to, he wants you to believe something else than the truth. And the truth is that God sent his son. He loves you. And because he loves you, he died for your sins. So what was happening? What were these Gnostics teaching? What was happening in the early church? What were they saying about Jesus Christ? Well, one of the early forms of of Gnosticism, you know what, the one that John is referring to, is that Jesus was nothing but a man. He was a regular human being. There was no virgin birth. There was nothing supernatural. There was no angel. There was no Holy Spirit. He was just a natural man. But what made him different is that the spirit of the Messiah came upon him at his baptism. Nothing spectacular about him before, nothing, nothing, nothing spiritual, and it came upon him. And the ministry and the miracles and everything he did was because the Messiah anointing was upon him. But when he died on the cross, that anointing was taken away from him. What died was a man, there was no resurrection, there was no ascension, there was no he's in heaven, no he's dead. All of that is a bunch of baloney. So what they said, what God offers us is... Uh, the, the Messiah spirit, that's what he promises. And, and what they were doing is they were denying that Jesus Christ, they were denying that he, all, everything about, that was one version. There was a lot of other versions that, that sort of came out of that in that early church. And by the way, they're still around today. You know, you can still find some of it today in, in the teachings of Christian science. And you know what, some of the other religions out there that claim to be Christians, but are, there's nothing Christian about them. But John says, be careful. You know what? They deny. What do they deny? They deny that the word was best flesh and dwelt among us. They deny that God's son came, broke into history. You know what? Did what he did. Died for us. They deny all of that. And and by the way, that that still exists. There are still ideas out there. You know what? That the virgin birth of Jesus didn't happen. The Bethlehem star never existed. The angels appearing to the shepherds. That's a bunch of baloney. You know what? Those are all myths that just add to make the story more attractable, but none of that really happened because Jesus was just a natural man. And John says, these people are liars because they deny that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And I'll tell you why that is so deadly. 
when you deny the only hope of mankind, Christ, God loving, sending son, when you deny that, we have no hope. When you deny that, there's nothing. You know, the devil attacks aggressively this truth that Jesus is the Christ because through that, he condemns us. There is no hope of heaven. There's no hope of eternal life. There's nothing out there. If he can destroy this, you know what? He, he sort of wipes out the basis of Christianity. So what the devil does, he strikes at the juggler veins. That's why these diabolical heresies that appear from time to time are striking at the heart of the Christian message. And by the way, this, it's important. Don't ever buy into anyone telling you you don't need Christ. Don't buy into any other explanation of Christ except that he was the the, the son of God. Now one day, Jesus, uh, the night before Jesus dies, he's with his disciples in the upper room. And he's telling them, I'm going to die. And I'm going to be raised from the dead. And I'm going to, you know, don't get discouraged. I'm I'm going to appear to you guys. And and as Jesus is saying that, the disciples are scratching their heads. They're a little perplexed. Philip in John, John records these in John 14. Philip, one of the apostles, he says this. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father that we will be satisfied. I'm going to the Father. He said, show us where the Father is. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own words, but my Father who lives in me does this work through me? In other words, he says, listen, I'm here because the Father sent me, I'm the, you know, and I, I reflect him, and, and he wants you to know how much you love him. Paul will confirm this when he writes to the Colossians in chapter 2, in verse 9, he writes these words. He says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and every authority. That's Christianity. So this lie that Jesus is not the Messiah is super dangerous. It cuts you off from what God has for you. It cuts you off from salvation. All that God has for us is available, you know what, through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But if he's not the Messiah, if he's not the Savior of the world, if he's not all that, then we have no hope. And that's what John wants to get across. Listen, this is what I think. For more than 2,000 years, you know what, the gospel of Jesus Christ has, has been preached. And for 2,000 years, men and women who lived in darkness, who live in confusion, in bewilderment, in despair, in heartache, in failure, in emptiness, in meaninglessness, in purposelessness, have found Jesus Christ not only to forgive their sins, but gave him new hope, new life, satisfaction. There are some of you right now that in this life, you're like asking yourself, there's got to be more than more money. You know what? More cars, more houses more sex. There's got to be more in life than just that. And you know, there comes a point in your life where you're going to realize there's got to be more, and there is. There's eternal life, and it starts here when you open your heart to the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That's Jesus Christ. So that's why all, all counterfeit Christianity denies who Jesus is. Let me end by telling you the story. In the, in, in the 80s, in the early 80s, and not as much today, but in 1985, there was a, a group of pastors, of theologians, They got together and they formed what was called the Jesus Seminar. And the goal of the Jesus Seminar was to reconstruct the life of Jesus. From an academic point of view, you know, social anthropologists, they were going to uncover, they were going to look at the textual analysis, they were going to look at all the the evidence, they were going to use all the tools at their disposal, and they were asking the question, who was this Jesus? Was he really historical? What did he do? What did he say? What did his sayings mean? So their, their reconstruction depended on, on, on you know what, on, on what we call naturalism, which means if we cannot see it, if we cannot experiment it, experiment with it, if we cannot, you know, reduplicate it some way, somehow, then it's, it's not real. So what they did is they came out, the Jesus Seminar came out, and they came out strong with a document that says, after looking at all of this, there was no such person as Jesus. There is no historical evidence, which is a bunch of baloney. There are no facts. You know what? There's nothing that we found that justifies the existence of this person. So you started hearing people make the arguments, well, do we even know Jesus lived? And I was like, that's the dumbest, forgive me, dumbest question I ever heard. Of course he lived. He's in the historical record. But here's the funny part. Here's the sad part about all this. During Easter and during Christmas, when you see all of those programs about who is the real Jesus and, you know what, the Gospels of this and that, which are Gnostic Gospels, you see all these programs that they put out and uh, questioning and sort of creating doubt 
in the lives of people about who Jesus was. If you watched any, you probably got more confused than anything. And what's interesting about these documentaries is that the, the consultants are people from the Jesus Seminar. So they'll put people up there to talk, and it's these guys that deny that Jesus exists, and they'll question, they'll tell you, well, you know, they say this, the Bible says this, but we don't know, we look, and nothing happened. And, and they, are, they are the liars that John is talking about. They're still around today. But here's what John's point is. John's point says, you know, don't be deceived. You know, over there in 1st of John, chapter 2, we'll look at that next week. He says, I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. Be alert. Be on guard. Don't be, de don't be deceived. Listen, there's a lot of deception out there. Be careful. You know, I, especially with the internet. Man, the internet has created so much confusion. There's some of you that are watching the internet you're watching YouTube, and you're watching guys talk about stuff that are false prophets, they're false teachers, and you're buying it, and you're sucking it all in, and you're taking it all in, and it's confusing you. You know what? Stay away from some of that stuff. Now, you say, well, Pastor, can I see it? Yeah, I see it, but compare it to what the Bible says. Because anyone can get on the internet, on YouTube, and say, I'm an expert. They're not experts. They don't have, they're not, trust me. And they're causing all kinds of weird stuff confusion, ideas. Uh, I feel bad for those of you that are into conspiracy theory. Man, there's all kinds. Uh, cons After yesterday, there's going to be all kinds of more conspiracy theories out there. Going to hear a good amen to that. Be careful. You know? <laughs> because you're going to get duped. And you know what happens? You know what I have found? And I'm going to pray after this. You know what I have found? I have found that after a while, we get so confused. We're like, say, you know what? This, I, I don't even know what to believe. This is all so confusing. I just quit. I'm just going to give up. And there's a lot of people walking away from Christianity, from their faith, because they're confused. But you know what? You're confused because you allowed yourself to be confused. No, don't, don't. Be on alert. Be on guard. Be careful with those who want to lead you astray. Can I hear a good amen? amen. All right, bow your heads. Let us pray. Our Father, we pray that we may understand these things and God be, be on the alert. Lord, we know that while there is truth, we also know there's a lot of falsehood. There's a lot of lies. And we know it because your word says it. We know it because we hear it. There's a lot of deception. But thank you for your word that guides us and directs us. And Father, more importantly, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that died for our sins. Lord, many of us have found new life, new direction, new hope. Lord, we found fulfillment in Jesus Christ, something we would never have found without you, Lord. And Father, thank you for loving us and reaching down to us. Father, thank you that you've given us everything that we need to be able to face the moments of pressure, of danger, of trial, of need in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we know that we don't walk through life alone, but you're with us. Thank you, Father, that we have a hope. One day we're going to take our last breath here and we will be with you. Lord, we're not waiting for eternal life. We're beginning to experience eternal life now. Lord, because eternal life is not the duration of life. It's the quality of life and the duration. And Lord, already our lives are different. I've been changed because of you. Father, I pray for your people. I pray that you would keep us focused on you. In Jesus' name, and as every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're here today, I don't want to let you go without praying for you. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, Pastor Vic, I, I need prayer. I, uh, I don't know Jesus. You're right. I've tried everything and nothing satisfies. You know, nothing fulfills. And I go to the next thing and I'm thinking this will do it. It doesn't do it. And you're saying that Jesus Christ will fulfill, will fill the emptiness in my heart. I, I want to open my heart to him. I want to experience that. If that is you, why don't you stand? Or maybe you've been here, you, you've come to Christ and you've walked away. And you're at that point where you say, man, I miss Jesus. I miss the peace, the joy. I, I miss the forgiveness. I miss the hope that he offers. I, 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 I think I'm disqualified myself. I no, I, I no longer can. And I say to you, yes, you can. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I just need prayer. Things are out of control in my life. You know, my marriage, my job, my children, just me, my mentality, my psyche, my emotions. I, I need help. So why don't you stand right now? Every eye closed, every head bowed. You know, it takes a lot. It takes a big man, big woman to stand and say, God, help me. You know, it takes a lot to be able to just say, Lord, I need you. I need your help. And I'll tell you, when we stand, we are making a statement. The statement is not to any person here, but it's to God. God, I, I acknowledge. 
I may be sharp, I may be educated, I may be very capable, I may be very successful, but Lord, there are things that are out of my control that, Lord, I believe you're the only one that can fulfill. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you right now. Father, those that have stood, every single one of us, Lord, have have areas in our lives, Lord, where we desperately need your help. I pray, God, that you would anoint them. Your word says that we are already anointed. We are capable. We have the ability. And sometimes, Lord, we forget that. And, Lord, we give in to our lower nature and make bad decisions. But, Father, I pray that your presence will just engulf your people today. I pray for those that do not know Christ, that as they open the door of their heart, that today they would experience new life, a newness, new perspective, everything your word promises to us. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you don't give up on us. People give up on us. Sometimes we give up on ourselves. But you never give up on us. We thank you for that. I pray your blessing. And I do so in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me, the rest of you? Would you give the Lord a hand clap? Amen. Good. Praise God. God is good. So be careful out there. Amen. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Let me send you off with a blessing. By raising your hands, you're saying, hey, I receive it. My desire is that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord would make his face shine upon you. That you would experience his favor, his love, his grace, his goodness, the joy, everything he offers. I pray you will leave here today. You know what? With the commitment to walk in the truth and being careful to not listen to falsehood. Be careful with the liars. God will show you who they are. Go in peace. We'll see you this week for BBS. We'll see you Wednesday. By the way, we still do have Wednesday Bible study at 7 o'clock. Join us. God bless you. Love one another. Greet one another. Go in peace. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless.